it's such a treat to be with the violinist Helen Kim and composer Sam Adams to talk about this beautiful project, Playing Changes. Uh, let's just um, begin with how the project came about um, and, and then we'll get to some of the specific pieces and where, but what was the uh, genesis of the project? How did it begin? So we had been um, not playing very much at the symphony. So I had been sitting at home for a while. Large gatherings obviously hadn't been going on for about four or five months at this point. And it was actually Sam's idea to curate a collection of short violin pieces with dance, um, something that we could self-produce, something that wouldn't take too much rehearsing or basically time together with anybody else. And he had written this piece, the first part of the violin diptych called Playing Changes uh, earlier, maybe in April, yeah. And we thought, hey, how about we ask three of our composer friends to write new pieces and we take three other pieces from the pre-existing rep that we loved, um, all new works, and we'll find a beautiful place to record it and we'll engage our dancer friends at Post Ballet. Um, we'd known Robert Decker as the director of Post for a very long time. Sam's worked with him many, many times. And yeah, it just kind of grew organically from there. We decided on a venue, our videographer friend, Ben Tarquin, he was in town. He's usually out of the country for most of the year, but because of COVID, all of these people were in the Bay Area and it was possible to do things flexibly. We had to cancel and reschedule a million times, but finally over three days kind of spaced apart over a couple months, we managed to record everything. It's one of the weird byproducts of this time, isn't it? That uh, people are both around and suddenly have time to do something you didn't anticipate doing. Yeah, that's... <clears throat> I mean, really just, if I can speak kind of solipsistically, like uh, Helen and I don't get to work together that often. Um, and we found ourselves, um, you know, in, in April, 2020, um, kind of twiddling our thumbs. You know, I, I had several projects which were either canceled or postponed. Um, so it, it, it only felt natural uh, to, yeah, to build something together and, and to, to find a way to collaborate really from the bottom up. Um, and as Helen mentioned, you know, the, the idea of collaborating together really was just within the very narrow context of writing a five minute piece, you know, which blossomed into a, you know, a two movement piece, which then blossomed into a, the idea of a video project with some other pre-existing rep. And then, you know, it just kind of, grew organically, which is, um, you know, really wonderful. I, I don't, I, I can't say that I've ever, you know, created music in this way. It's always, you know, as a composer, my, my, my job most of the time is, you know, is trying to, to fill some kind of prescribed box. Um, and, uh, and this is, you know, quite, quite the opposite. It really is for me, one of the most special projects to emerge from this a strange time because so many of projects are kind of postcards of conventional music performance and there's nothing wrong with that but this seems wholly conceived in particular for this medium and uh, um, Ben Tarquin the videographer and Robert Deckers the choreographer and the dancers all seem sort of integral to the conception um, once the pieces were written, how did um, everything else kind of take life and weave, weave in to create this whole? What was the process? The, the choreographer heard the piece, the conversations with the, uh, with the filmmaker about kind of the visualization of the dance and performance. Do you want well, to like this? Yeah, we were trying to basically not be in the same space as much as possible to allow for work to kind of ferment 
um, just me working on my stuff and the dancers working with just Robert. So I would record just a rough draft of whatever piece um, and Robert would go with one dancer at a time to like Golden Gate Park um, and rehearse just with a speaker of my playing. He, he would give me some feedback like, oh, could this part be a little bit slower to allow for you know these steps to happen? And I would take that feedback and record another version of it and then send it back. And you know, we just did back and forth a bunch of times. And also with the composers, there was a lot of back and forth um, because these were brand new pieces. Um, like Elizabeth, for example, had written a piece with Scordatura and I'm like notoriously bad with Scordatura. <laughs> and just because of the practical concerns of being in a space that's going to be very cold and detuning down, you know, three strings, a whole step could not bode well for my very <laughs> finicky instrument. Um, I would say like, would you mind actually conceiving of this in a way that could be played on normally tuned strings or whatever? Like, can I speed this up, slow things down? The normal process between um, composer and performer. Um, everything was really intimately connected in that way. And I felt throughout the whole process, there was a lot of give and take. And of course, once the videos were shot, there were, you know, 3000 emails between Ben me, Sam, Robert, talking about things that we could edit. Like sometimes I wouldn't like a shot of me and I didn't sound good, but the dance was beautiful at that part, you know? So it was always a collaboration and um, just a coming together of various ideas that we had. The um, other pretty fabulous presence in this videos, uh, in these videos is the location, which, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, Tell us what it is, where it is, how you found it, and you know, what your idea about its place in, in uh, these videos is. Because it feels like a partner to the collaboration. So much so. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a, a logistical and perhaps an artistic justification for using location, which is nice to have both. Um, the space is the s historic 16th Street train station um, in West Oakland, um, you know, a very industrial part of the city. This station used to be the, the final stop along the line that the California Zephyr takes all the way from Chicago out to, um, out to the West Coast. A gorgeous space which has a very interesting history. It was the, the location of the first um, Black Porter Union strike, um, Pullman Porter, and uh, you know, it's it's been preserved, uh, I think, really beautifully over over you know the last um, you know two decades or so. It's also you know just it's an incredible acoustic. You know, I I, I, I had to deal with the uh, the ever you know the omnipresence of the I eighty, which is about fifty feet away from the <laughs> the backside of the the building. So um, as the sound designer of the project, I had to do quite a lot of, you know, noise reduction and whatnot. Um, but the space itself is just so unbelievably beautiful and resonant. And uh, I think Helen sounds really gorgeous in, in, in the building. So Helen, um, how was it finally to walk into the building and suddenly be in the company of the dancer um, and the elements were put together? Did it, did it, um, change things and shape things once you were assembled and how acutely aware were you of the, the dance in your playing? Well, the dancers were great. I mean, they were most of the time pretty far from me or in the back of me. So I couldn't really make too much eye contact with them. And um, yeah, I would say more than the presence of the dancers, what was a little bit unsettling for me, this is the challenge of recording things um, 
temperature. There is no electricity in this building. So, I mean, we had to rent porta potties. He had a generator that powered the mics and like one light. Um, I tried to plug in my hair curler and it blew the field. <laughs> it was a very tiny generator. So like no heat whatsoever. And the thing that's absolutely the most destructive to one's playing is cold. And so I was trying to play Philip Glass, for example. It's like, da -da 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 oh my goodness, I thought I was going to get like tendonitis immediately from that encounter. Um, mm -hmm. And the noise, as Sam mentioned, the freeway noise. And you know, of course, when you're getting your one good take, there's a dog barking or the dump truck going beep, 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 mm -hmm. right outside. <laughs> um, yeah, so. Other than that, other than those challenges, I felt that being in such a beautiful resonant space was such an inspiration because of course, all of us had only been playing like over Zoom for donor events and such for the symphony in our living rooms. And so suddenly it was acoustically a much more flattering space to be in and um, yeah, it, it was really lovely to get a chance to be someplace bigger. It's not a hall, but you know, it was it was really wonderful. Sam, we'll end by sampling your own piece, which in a, in a way generated the the project. And as you said at the very beginning, um, you suddenly moved away from having to write something, a commissioned piece or an orchestra piece to uh, uh, weirdly available time and space. Um, when you began playing changes, how did, how did it originate? Was it just beginning to sit down and write what was in your brain and, and with this project in mind or just a more pure act of writing something down for Helen? Yeah, it was a very pure act. It happened very, very quickly. It, genuinely felt like a collaboration writing it M most senses it's a very conventional piece you know it's conventionally notated uh, however um there was a you know a palpable sense of you know biofeedback you know sending her some phrases and being able to hear what they sound like and um she <laughs> i think during the first kind of uh like practice recording session that we did in june last year um, the best take that you had actually, I, I forget if you had extended or shortened one of the phrases, oh, yeah. but we decided that the piece was better based on whatever her intuition had decided <laughs> in the moment. So we went with that, um, which is, you know, something obviously that you can't do, uh, <laughs> certainly in a orchestral context, shall we say. Um, so yeah, I mean, in a, in a weird way, I, I feel like we kind of co-compose the piece in a sense. <laughs> Hardly, it's just that my memory of the piece was not quite up to par and we had to record that day. So I'd only known it for a few days and I was trying to navigate. And the great thing about just having him available to change the piece is that based on my mistakes, he can just alter the <laughs> sheet music. <laughs> right, so the, the title I suppose has a triple entendre then. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um and um in the video we hear the first movement of a piece that's now the violin diptych um and um, uh, we'll look forward to uh hearing the second movement in 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 context at the ojai festival but the first movement is called playing changes and the second movement's called changes move. Well, thanks um, to uh, uh, both of you um, and uh, to everybody watching this. Uh, I hugely encourage you to go to the San Francisco Symphony's website and watch uh, all seven of the newly created uh, videos uh, with pieces uh, recent pieces and newly composed pieces, uh, but today we'll focus and turn to uh, Sam Adams as playing changes as played by Helen Kim uh, with 
the, the post-ballet and choreography of Robert Decker's 